you know, this is a huge surprise, as you can imagine. Here you think you've built up your supply side, everything's ready to go, and then you discover that your supply side is not at all interested. Welcome to Two Sided, the Marketplace Podcast, brought to you by ShareTribe. Hi, I'm Stuart, CMO at ShareTribe, and I am your host. In this episode, I talk to Ruthie Ameru, CEO of Fredos, which is a marketplace for freight. We'll talk about how to serve fragmented markets, which have complex workflows and that have a lot of middlemen. We talk about how they get supply on board before having demand using single player mode about building for trust and basically loads of other great things. I really, really learned a lot from this episode about B2B marketplaces, and I hope you will too. Enjoy. Hi, Ruth. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, great to be here. Really exciting to talk to you today. Same here. I love talking about marketplaces. Yeah, so could you give the audience like this short background on who is Ruth and what did you do at Fredo as and specifically how did you end up here? Well, you know, I've spent my entire career in startups. Israel is a startup nation, really lots and lots of startups. I've probably been in about nine or 10 different startups over my career. A bunch of them actually were business to business startups. I ran the R&D team uh, in a company that did B2B auctions later acquired by a company called VerticalNet. Later, I ran product and R&D in a company called Unicorn, later acquired by IBM, and was just a you know part of many startups in the R&D product, later the business space. Many of them that focused on business systems, which I really like, what makes a business work, how businesses do business, basically. And so I was pretty excited when our founder, uh, Svi Schreiber asked me to come join him. I had actually done two startups with him already. This was the third startup that he was doing, and he asked me to come join him and build a marketplace. Uh, and he said, it's a B2B marketplace. What else could you want? And I was like, well, yeah. B2B marketplace, what else could I want? So that's how I got to Fredos. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what is Fredos. So yeah, I wasn't really sure what Fredos was when I joined because you know people in the high-tech industry don't always understand freight because freight is real right? Freight is actually about large boxes and containers moving from one place on the globe to another place on the globe. And Fredo set out to make freight simple. And obviously for us in the tech world, we can't imagine how actually complicated it is or was before companies like Fredo started digitizing it. But the freight world was a world, and, and this is where Tzvi, you know, came up with this idea is he worked in a company that shipped lighting devices around the world. And he said, well, you know, okay, I need to book a container to move 20,000 lighting devices from China to the U.S. And he figured he would go online, find a container, book it, you know, put his credit card through and be done. And he was just basically floored to discover how complicated it was, including the need of emails and faxes and phone calls. So he set out, he said, okay, we need to digitize freight. And he always had in mind from day one, this idea of building an Expedia for freight. So the same as you go online and book a passenger travel, book a flight, um, you'd be able to book passage for your shipment or shipments. It's that simple in terms of the idea. But then actually the, you know, making it happen was a lot more complicated. Yeah, I can relate to that. I used to work for a hardware startup. We used to make this home energy management system. And I remember having to deal with getting like a bunch of prototypes from China to Finland. Yeah. And we couldn't do anything because the couple of companies that I found, like, let's say I found five and two of them wanted to first visit the office to make a deal. <laughs> exactly. And I was like, no, we just need like 500 of them here, like by next month. Right. Why is this such a problem? So yeah, this is about a marketplace for freight. So what are the, you know, marketplace always supply side, what's demand side? So how is that for Fredos? So the demand side are importers and exporters, like you sitting in Finland wanting to import some prototypes from China, or somebody who's building something and then exporting it, right? So anybody really who's importing or exporting is on our demand side, right? Our buyer side. Mm -hmm. And the sellers are anyone who provides logistic services. So that would be anybody who helps importers and exporters get their goods from one place to another. 
And, you know, we'll maybe talk about this further on down, but that can be a multi-tiered system because the industry is actually a little bit more complicated than just single businesses that do the end-to-end move. When you move freight, it has to go through a lot of different stages. So the supply side is actually a little bit more complex, but it's basically made up of logistics providers or people who move goods around the world. Yeah. Is there a way you can untie that a little bit? Because I listened to a couple of your presentations and I know that you have a nice visual representation usually, (laughs) because I feel that that is the place where Fredo's is actually providing the value, right? I mean, it's a classic marketplace part, fragmented markets, et cetera, et cetera. So could you untangle maybe a little bit the supply side? Because that is where, of course, the magic happens. Sure. You know, it's funny. It's only recently that I've understood that we're not the only ones taking these complex supply sides and trying to untangle that and make it work. But the way the freight world works is that there are carriers, right? So the carriers are the companies that actually own the vehicles that move freight. So if you're doing a move and you need to move a pallet from, let's say, China to Finland, you're going to start in Shanghai. A truck is going to back up to the factory there and pick up your pallet of goods and take it to a warehouse near a port. At the warehouse, it's then gonna have to start going through export customs. And then eventually, once it's completed that, it could be loaded on a plane or a ship, does what it needs to do to get to the other side of the world. Then it's unloaded, import customs, maybe some warehousing for some time, and then a delivery truck again. So all of those pieces are managed usually or owned by multiple different businesses. You might own a truck or two trucks. You might be a customs broker. You might actually be a ship operator or an airline, right? And there's this additional tier within the freight industry of businesses called freight forwarders. And these are service providers who tie together the entire end-to-end business for you, an importer, so you don't need to think about all those different pieces. So the freight forwarders are taken basically from the truck that backs into the factory up until my front door? So funnily enough, what they do is they just call all these people. (laughs) They don't do anything, right? All they do is figure out what it is you're shipping. So they call your supplier and say, how big is it really? And they get the real size. And then they book it on an airplane, let's say, because you said you need it right away. Uh, And then once they've booked it on the airplane, they arrange for a truck to go pick it up. So they're not ever touching the freight generally, the freight forwarders. All they're doing is like they're project managers almost, or they're, you know, party organizers, right? So they get all these different pieces, you know, put together. And in that case, A platform or a marketplace can do two things. You know, the simple thing is just let those party planners advertise their parties, right? So let those party planners figure out how much it's actually going to cost to move freight, post the prices online, and then when a booking's made, go ahead and execute the shipment. But if you think about it, once you create a technology that's an intermediary, you as the buyer may say, you know what? I don't want you to handle the trucking to my warehouse. I'm going to go, you know, get my uncle who has a truck to pick it up. Or, you know, I'd like a little bit more control because I want to control the price. I want to control the transit time. I want to control, you know, the quality and who I use. And so suddenly, because it's a marketplace and it's a technology, we started to see where we could potentially break up the entire end-to-end service and make it more of a, like a mix and match. So. I was going to regularly do this just to, <laughs> to clear this up because I'm not an expert on freight. But are you in competition then with freight forwarders? Is Freydos like an alternative to the classic freight forwarders? Well, in the long term, possibly. In the short term, not at all, because there's still so many complications in the world of freight that freight forwarders have an important role. And at the moment, most of our sellers are freight forwarders. But We know, and the freight forwarders know, that eventually, you know, layers are stripped out. That's what happens in a technology-based world, is that people create technologies. You know, the travel agents, they disappear eventually. You know, they were very, very useful, and there are some people who probably still occasionally call a travel agent for something complicated, and it didn't happen overnight, right? It took 20, you know, plus years to make it so that there was just no role for them. So I think the freight forwarders kind of know that and the smart freight forwarders 
are looking for ways to, you know, add additional value. Okay, that's clear. Yeah, I wasn't sure if the aim was about that, but there are so many still moving parts that you can provide to them basically as well. Correct. All right. And so this is a very big idea, very big, like you already mentioned, complex set of services that you basically offer in one platform. Surely that wasn't all there in the first version. Right. So (laughs) what was the first version? Okay. So the first kind of thing I probably need to answer is the chicken and egg question, right? Always the question when you're building a marketplace is, are you, do you start by building up your supply or your demand? Yeah. And in the case of Fredos, we actually had decided up front that we were going to build up the supply first, because not only do you need to choose, right? Where do I start supply or demand? But our supply side didn't even know how to automate their pricing yet. So if you were to call a freight forwarder, and even today, if you called, you know, as you described, they wanted to come to your office, right? You have to call them because they would then spend many days trying to put together a pricing quote for you. So when we founded Freitos, we actually knew upfront that we needed three years to build a supply side platform that would allow for automated pricing. So that was step one. I mean, I wasn't even in the company then. The company spent three years building a SaaS platform to allow freight forwarders to, with one push of a button, create their pricing with all those different pieces that I mentioned, the trucking and the customs brokers and all those different pieces. So this is often referred to as this single player mode, right? Yes. Yeah, where you offer something to a site that can use the marketplace without the other side being present, right? Exactly, exactly. They had their own demand side that they were talking to on the phone and they were creating PDFs from the SaaS to send out with automated pricing. The value proposition to the supply side was just, hey, here's a tool that will make your job much, much easier. And then, and we rolled that out to a thousand service providers, which is quite a lot. I mean, it's more than enough to seed the supply side. Yeah. Do you remember, or remember is not the right word, you weren't there at the time, but was the pricing, that was something that had come up after some customer research? He talked to many, or did he have some experience? Or of course, did he mention experience in this world? Right. They decided that pricing is the pain point. He decided that the pricing was a big enough pain point that it was a good kind of way to get started working with these forwarders. And it was actually a necessary step in order to be able to create that Expedia, right? So if you go ahead and you say, I'm going to create a marketplace for dog walking, right? Dog walkers may not know how to price their services. So that's going to be the first thing you need to do. Yeah, no, that makes total sense, especially after what you just described, like all the different moving parts that make up a price in that service or in that particular industry. Exactly. So great. So first, supply got onboarded through a value proposition in form of a SaaS business. And then how did you move the first demand on board initially? So, you know, as you can imagine, we even before I joined, we experimented a little bit with, you know, what is it going to take? How mature does the supply side need to be before we can bring on demand? a couple of experiments that didn't work. But then when I came on board, actually, the idea was to take the entire supply side we already had using our SaaS, flip a switch, turn them on, and voila, there we would have a marketplace. Of course, that doesn't work. (laughs) It doesn't work like that. Uh, But we did it. We did do it. We, first of all, obviously, the people who had bought SaaS from us had not signed up necessarily to sell on a marketplace. So, This is a very kind of opaque market. Most of them said, absolutely not. It's great that you're giving us this SaaS. We have absolutely no interest in publishing our rates online. So the first thing was actually to find any of the, you know, this is a huge surprise, as you can imagine. Here you think you've built up your supply side, everything's ready to go. And then you discover that your supply side is not at all interested. (laughs) They're like, no, right? Uh, so that was okay, because by building that supply side software, we had all the software in place, we'd already figured out exactly how to do the pricing, which is on its own novel. So then we just went out to the market. And rather than saying to these freight forwarders, hey, would you like to publish your rates online? We changed the pitch to, hey, can we bring you some more business? And uh, obviously, you know, a bunch of them said, yes, we got a nice group. We got them ready to go and we published and we were ready to go with worldwide coverage for anybody who wanted to import or export. And that didn't work, right? You cannot start a marketplace that's that big because we'd have, 
you know, small importers, we discovered that there's a very big difference between an importer who's bringing in 30 prototypes from China, you know, just to play around uh, and a <laughs> yeah. Walmart, right? So suddenly you discover, oh my goodness, there's so, and then you discover, wow, people who are importing into the United States are totally different to people who are importing into India. And, and I mean, the world is so big and you look at things from the outside and they all seem so simple the minute you step in. And I think at about that point, I heard a great podcast by the founder of Fiverr who said, no, it wasn't Fiverr. I think it was actually Get, who said, you know what, when we started Get, which is a taxi app, we started it in one block. There was like one little square block, yeah. right? And I was like, ah, that, right? Yeah. So we basically narrowed down. We went from the entire world and everybody in the world to very small importers and exporters from China to the U.S. So you did both because usually this constraining happens, right? You constrain the marketplace in some way in order to achieve liquidity. We'll yeah. I'm surely we'll move into that later. So, and then usually it's either constrained by a geological location, like the block that you mentioned, yeah. or by some category. But now it sounds to me that you kind of did both. So you sort of constrained the geologically to China and the US, and then also to a particular type of importer. Did I get that right? Yep. We said yeah. China, US, very small importers who are importing boxes or pallets. And it was a radical narrowing. As a matter of fact, my CEO at the time joked, he said, you know, next you're going to tell me you're only doing this zip code to that zip code. And I, I basically said, if that's what it takes to start to build liquidity, that's what we'll do. Yeah. But that's when we started to actually see orders and really build liquidity and start to grow. Yeah. Do you remember like anything about sort of the first transaction? That's usually like a glory moment in company history <laughs> sure. or the first couple. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure we wouldn't be the first ones who built, you know, the search and then a select and then a big old book button. And our book button was pink at the time. I remember that. And all the book button did, and I was certain nobody would ever hit that book button, but what the book button did was actually sent an email to me and to somebody else, you know, an operations manager. We had optimistically, you know, hired an operations manager. And I was like, no, don't worry. You're not going to get. And then we get this email, right? And we're like, okay, now what? <laughs> right? Somebody actually hit book. Yeah. So we're like, okay, well, you know, I said to the operations manager, you call the buyer, I'll call the seller, and let's see if this is actually <laughs> a real transaction, if we can make this happen. And he called the buyer and she said, so how do I pay? And he's like, uh, pay, uh, PayPal, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then she said, oh, okay, what's the payment fee? And he's like, uh, 3%, right? Yeah. And, you know, the processing fee. So the first few transactions were, you know, obviously took a lot of handholding after yeah. About three months of transactions, um, I brought in somebody who was already on our team. I said, okay, you now own supply because we didn't really realize how much you had to own the supply side and really manage the data and, the, you know, what was coming through the supply side. And he looked at it. He said, listen, I'm going to have to tear it all down and start afresh because right now the things that are coming through, you're going to book them. They're not going to be binding rates and it, it's just no good. And so I let him do that because that's another thing that we learned many times the hard way is that if you're not keeping within your scope, if you don't have clean data, if you don't have clean processes, all the noise that you create from non-standard transactions, it just breaks you, right? And it's worth dropping it, you know? Do you mean noise towards like product development decisions, those kind of things? So I mean that anytime somebody books a transaction, if it takes a lot of people to fix it up so that it'll go through. And our transactions are large transactions. They're, you know, $1,800, yeah. you know, on average. So it's not unreasonable that people might touch a transaction like that from a unit economics perspective. But what was very clear to us is that marketplaces, well, marketplaces, you're actually, your revenue is the rake, which is only going to be a percentage of that booking. Yeah. So you have zero money to spend. So you have to have clean data. You can't have a, what I mean by messy or dirty supply is like, if you have somebody who's publishing something and then after a transactions book, they change the price on you or they cancel it or they don't do a great job, you just can't afford that. Understood. Yeah. So basically we're talking about supply quality. 
Yeah. Yeah. So supply quality, because that was going to be my next question exactly. Like what problems? So once you first play concierge, right? Like concierge marketplace mm -hmm. for a while, sounds like it. Mm -hmm. Then you hope to optimize, like you said, a couple of these steps in between because you simply don't have the unit economics to handhold everybody all the time. Right. What were the biggest things there? Like what were the first things that you optimized there? Well, you know, the first thing we optimized really was the data quality on the supply side and insisting that it be really strictly standardized. And that was hard, actually, the SaaS we had built. Well, like any SaaS system wants to have enough configuration capabilities for configuring to be good for a lot of people. So, so actually, anybody who was using our SaaS could build their pricing in all these wonderful different ways. But then when you showed them to the buyers, it wasn't apples to apples. So really, I think that that was foundational work that we had to do to standardize within the context of a marketplace what the pricing looked like. And then we had to build really a good review system so that we could allow the buyers to review their freight services. I think the biggest pieces of work that we did then, really the biggest shift was when we built our SOP. So, you know, you're creating this world, right? When you're building a marketplace, your world is a world in which suddenly parties that didn't have the opportunity to do business directly are doing business directly. And the foundation of the world that you build is software, but it's built on a legal foundation of how these two people are doing business. And your terms and conditions or your standard operating procedure, as the case may be in some industries, becomes really your IP, right? So it took me a long time to understand how important it is to define what the buyer is, what the seller is, what their responsibilities were, what the marketplace is, what the role of the marketplace is, right? And to do that in very legal binding terms. So it was really once that started to come together very, very well that we really saw the trust on the two sides and both the supply side and the demand side feeling much more comfortable that this was a framework that was protecting them, basically, and, you know, was a good place to do business. Wow, that sounds amazing. Like, I often come back to these three things that I think I heard this from Matthias Ockenfels from Speed Invest who says that for him, the, the pillars of a marketplace has always been trust, transparency, and efficiency. Mm -hmm. And you you just tick these boxes so nice that I'm afraid I'm running out of questions here. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the trust because I had a follow-up question on the quality, which I didn't do. Sure. So if we can quickly go back to there, which is kind of like, you know, part of the trust pillar, let's say, because you have to be able to trust the supply side. So How did you maintain and how do you maintain quality on the supply side or on the seller side for that same question? Sure. The first thing I'll say is that when we looked at the question of trust, we wanted to have a very clear paradigm, like a, you know, a single sentence that described in the world of trust, what we were offering the supply side, what we were offering the demand side. And in our case, our guarantee, and it's actually a legal guarantee to the supply side, right, to the freight forwarders and the logistics providers is we guarantee that you will be paid. That's yeah, simple. That's powerful. Yeah. They're working with people they've never met. And that was a big leap to take because in order to do that, we had no idea if we'd be paid. But we just said, look, this is how we get them. This is how we, that was the question they were asking us all the time, right? Who are these people? Who are these buyers? How do I know they'll pay us? And we said, you don't worry. We guarantee you'll be paid. Yeah. And then the, the kind of the parallel or the one that we offered the buyers and the demand side is we said, the price won't change. And in many marketplaces, that's obviously trivial, but in the freight industry, it actually, the price changes all the time. And it's one of the fears and it's one of the pain points and one of the frustrations of many buyers is that they get a quote and then it changes and changes and more and more fees get added because the way freight forwarders work is their pass-throughs. They're, as we said, they're the party planners. Who's ever made a party, 
you know, with a party planner and actually stuck to the budget, right? Oh, yeah, well, they didn't have that flower. So we bought these flowers instead. And that cost another $100. And we ran out last minute to buy ice. And that cost another, right? And free forwarders work like that as well. They're like, well, you know, we couldn't get on that flight we promised you. So it was a different flight. And that flight was more expensive. Or, oh, hey, the trucker had to wait three hours at the factory. And so that's another $100. And this was very, very frustrating to the demand side. So being able to give those two very, very clear promises or guarantees was fundamental kind of in terms of creating that trust. And that's, you know, the foundation. Yeah. How did it work out in practice? Because like on both sides, you're dealing with real reasons why people might not get paid and also real reasons why it might get more expensive. I mean, of course, there are some people maybe who act in bad faith and make up a price, for example, I can see that. But it also sounds like that in many cases, indeed, like if a shipment can't make a particular ship or plane and you need to book another one, it just adds to the price. So once you gave the guarantee, how did that work out? Did you end up paying a lot? Did you end up losing a lot of money? Did, how often did that guarantee get called in? So first of all, we did put a, a budget line towards making good on that guarantee, even though sometimes it cost us money. And uh, actually, that was very helpful to have that budget, have that little pool of money to be able to do that. But it was kind of like a guiding light because for everything we did, we said, okay, now how do we make good on this promise? So what was became clear very quickly is that sometimes the buyers make mistakes. They book a shipment, they say it's 13 boxes, but it's 16 boxes. So it's really not fair yeah. for them to pay for the 13 boxes, right? So we quickly had to build some logic around what happens if dimensions change or if the goods aren't ready when you say they are, right? So really, what are the things that become the responsibility of the buyer? And if the buyer communicated them incorrectly, then there's going to be a change, right? So mm -hmm. um, to be and to educate, you know, the buyers up front so they understand that. And then the second thing is to find the right suppliers, the right partners on the supply side who understand that you win some, you lose some. So sometimes I'll pay a little bit more, sometimes I'll pay a little bit less, but I'm benefiting a lot to preset my pricing, right? In the story, you know, my CEO likes to say, you know, can you imagine if you went into a pizza place and they said, okay, so the crust is going to run you $10 and the sauce will be another dollar. And if you want mushrooms, that's, you know, and it's not the way it works. You know, most people have learned how to create pricing. And so we worked with our freight forwarders to do that, to say, Here's how you buffer yourself a little bit so that you're winning more than you're losing and then just stick with it. And then we had to build a whole layer of KPIs on the supply side to reflect to the supply side how they're doing. So each of the sellers can now see how they're doing. Uh, they can see how to be more competitive, but they can also see, you know, what are their reviews? How many times have they kind of transgressed on the SOP or the terms and conditions. So, and we kind of hold them to that to an extent. And if people don't hold them, do you kick them off? Yeah, we absolutely do. You know, our supply side is kind of a high quality. There's a lot of investment in the supply side. So mm -hmm. we don't just like willy nilly, you know, oh, hello, goodbye. We work with these people, we bring them on. So we try very much. But if we have somebody who's just not playing by the rules, then we kick them off. Yeah, it sounds like maybe even like trust is almost the most important thing in your marketplace. I mean, like efficiency, I'm guessing that also like standalone freight forwarders, etc. They're sort of catching on to that, I can imagine. Yeah. And like transparency, maybe as well. But this trust issue sounds like it could be sort of your number one moat. Am I right? Uh, I, no, I'd say they're all there. They're all there. I mean, I trust yeah. is a big one on any marketplace, right? You're getting people to do business together who've you know, never seen each other. So no, that's, you know, no. just huge. But I, I think that's what's so fun, right, about building a marketplace. I mean, it's you're building this massive system and you have so many, it's like a multiplayer game, you know, it's like, oh, wow. Yeah. You know, what do we fix next? What do we optimize? How do we choose mm -hmm. what's next? Yeah, exactly. No, a, a multiplayer game. I have to say that I like it. I haven't heard anyone use that <laughs> metaphor yet. But that's true. Yeah. And then uh, talking about moats and talking about trust, of course, trust between the supply side and the demand side. But 
how is the trust between Fredos and the users? And I'm now zooming in on the question of uh, this intermediation because you, you mentioned its average order is 800,000. 1800. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 1800. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So that leaves some space for disintermediation, I would say. How are you handling that? Yeah, that's a tough one. I think at the moment, our sellers prefer for us to manage it because they don't want to handle the collection. So they send people back even if they've gone. So we do have, definitely do have buyers going off platform to the sellers. And in general, the sellers send them back to us because they prefer to manage it on platform. Yeah. But it's still a challenge for us. It's still something, you know, we look at and we think about a lot, for example, potentially we could, you know, in any B2B setting. So B2B is fundamentally different. I mean, B2B is this exploding space, right? B2B marketplaces. And yeah. it's a great place to be. But one of the biggest challenges there is the B2B is repeat business which is very hard to keep on platform because just, you know, fundamentally, if somebody's doing the same thing over and over again, they may develop a, a relationship and they'd want to just go off and do it on their own. So this is definitely something we spend a lot of time thinking about, even considering maybe we create a white labeled version of our platform for our sellers so that if they do want to, if a buyer does want to work only with one seller, we allow that. So, I mean, you know, that we haven't done that yet, but we're constantly thinking about it. Yeah, because often what is said is that, indeed, like if there is a chance for repeat purchase, then if the only thing that you're offering as the platform is the matching part, then, then the chances are really big. But it sounds like already what you mentioned with the trust part. And the guarantee, those are sounds like really good reasons for stay on the platform. Right. And we also have a pretty deep management kind of for the same reason, also the trust we've had to build a full track and trace so you can actually track your shipment end to end, Yeah, which in itself also gives an additional layer of both trust, but also a reason to stay on the platform. Yeah. So over the time you've grown like pretty seriously, do you have any, you know, sound bites, takeaways for supply or demand that's like, okay, this was a huge growth lever for us? Yeah, I think really the scoping is always the growth lever. Every single time, every time we take, you know, different opportunities and we race in lots of different directions at the same time and we, you know, open up and we say, wait, let's add, you know, a whole bunch of different product types and let's add some new geographies. And every time we do that, it's actually when we trim back, uh, we identify from all the different things we've played with, which ones are working and we trim everything else off, that's when we suddenly see our growth spurts. Yeah. You know, it's almost like a tree, literally, yeah. know, or a plant. Yeah. You know? So focus, focus, focus. Yeah. There's this one, I think it's called Sarah Tell from Benchmark, I think. She has this metaphor of like a white hot center. Like that's, you should just yeah. get white hot centers everywhere. And that's what you should focus on and nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. easy just for me to say on this side, obviously, and being on the outside. Yeah. You just need to focus. But it is, <laughs> we also see that at Share Tribe always like people with the very first version and they're ready to take on the world and become the global marketplace for everything. And it is very challenging to indeed keep the right scope, keep the right focus. Yeah, yeah. I think the other areas that have been, you know, big leverage for us, which is relevant probably to a lot of marketplaces is that it's partnerships. You know, we have a partnership now with Alibaba where um, actually we're providing the freight for the Alibaba B2B marketplace. So finding oh, wow. those, yeah. So, and we've been, you know, we have a number of other important partnerships and as a digital, you know, you're, whatever you're doing in your marketplace, you're part of somebody's whole supply chain. You're not everything. You're a piece. And finding the other players who are taking on other pieces and then connecting, right? It's just software. So let's figure out how yeah. to connect it, right? So that's yeah. so that's also been a, a big uh, a big amplifier. Yeah. And uh, was there anything you would have done differently that you're like, oh, well, we tried this, that never going to do that again? I think the biggest, you know, things I regret are when we decided beforehand what was going to work and then decided to invest a huge amount up front, right? And we made a decision to move to much larger importers and it was just hard to test the waters. So, you know, there's some things that are easy to test the waters, some things that are hard. That was a hard thing to test the waters. We invested a lot 
and uh, it didn't pan out, you know? So you mean like big names that even I would know? Yeah. So I I think that one of the things that is also a fundamental of building marketplace is that model, right? Is having, you know, we didn't talk at all about data, but we could do a different one sometimes to talk about data, but understanding your underlying core model and not trying to 100 exit ever. What you're doing is you're trying to tweak it and tweak it and improve it and take little bits of investment and see what works. I mean, you're building a new world. You can be pretty certain that, you know, you really want a a whole mall complex over there, but don't just, you know, put a stand there and see if people buy and, you know, just like build slowly, incrementally. I think that's one of the keys. Yeah. One last question about the big guys. Because I feel that, and this is more of a gut feeling, I don't have any scientific evidence for that, but I often have the feeling that when working, especially in B2B, serious high-end B2B, is that Mm -hmm. a lot of the known guys, they rely Mm -hmm. so much of their business on brand Mm -hmm. and trust that was previously just not available. I feel that they're kind of in a marketplace, that advantage is sort of taken (laughs) away. So I'm not actually that surprised, and that's easy, of course, to say later from the outside, That doesn't work too well for them. How do you feel about that statement? You know, actually, if you look at almost anything that's been commoditized, eventually, you know, anything that can be commoditized will be commoditized. And it's true. And that's, you know, part of the difficulty is definitely that they needed a person, they needed an account manager, it just got very, very expensive to manage. But it's just a question of time, because if you look now, even large companies are booking travel, you know, work, travel, business travel online. After many, many years of saying, no, we would never do that. We're working with X and we're working with this travel agency and they give us a, they give us invoice, you know, whatever it is we need from them. And then they're realizing, you know what, at some point you need to move to the next stage. And, you know, as startups, we always have to figure out, are we at that next stage yet or is it a little premature? So, you know, we push the envelope and it's eventually, eventually somebody's going to get in there. Yeah. All right. Last question. So what's next for Fredo? So which geos are you handling now? Are you already global? If not, then what are the next opportunities for you in terms of new markets or new revenue models? Oh, gosh, so many. We're currently focused mostly on buyers in the US, UK and Canada. We're expanding to Europe, Australia, and possibly even the Middle East. So we're expanding now through partnerships with B2B marketplaces to really go global. That may take five years, but that's what we're doing. Uh, We're also expanding the products that we have available. So not just shipping, but also warehousing and connections to other services that importers might need, like trade finance and quality assurance. We're also expanding and deepening our connections and going actually to work directly with airline carriers and with ocean carriers and with express carriers. So moving all the way in. So, but again, when I say we're doing all these things, that's our canvas. That's our five-year canvas. But then we take it a piece at a time, right? We take it a small piece at a time into all of these areas. And, you know, world trade is $19 trillion market. And even the one, you know, the area that we're in is many hundreds of billions of dollars that we're looking at. So we have a large canvas to paint on and we're just getting started. All right, Ruth, that was a really great interview. I learned a lot about freight, learned a lot about Freydos. Where can people find Freydos? So just online, freydos.com, F-R-E-I-G-H-T-O-S.com. Check it out. It's free to sign up and try it out. All right. Thanks for being here and we'll be in touch. Okay, thank you for having me and happy to talk about marketplaces anytime. All right, bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Two Sided, the Marketplace podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe. If you listen on iTunes, we'd also love for you to rate and give us a review. If you got inspired to build your own marketplace, go visit www.sharetribe.com. It's the fastest way to build a successful online marketplace business. Until next time.